Okay, so got this cute cartoon. Sorry to bother you, ma'am. We sent out a million offers for magazine subscriptions and you were one of the 20,000 who was supposed to subscribe. So we actually will be looking at expected values for binomial distributions. And we're gonna also introduce one more distribution, geometric, which good news, not as complicated as the binomial. All right, so let's go back to the binomial distribution. Let's say you flip a coin 100 times. How many heads would you expect? So if it's a fair coin, you would expect 50 heads, right? And that's what the distribution looks like. Now, if the coin is unfair and lands on heads only 20% of the time, how many would you expect? 20, right? So your peak would be there at 20 instead of at 50. Now let's say another coin is lands on heads 90% of the time. How many heads would you expect for that one? 90, and it would be kind of distributed over to the right like so. Okay, so uh, this leads us to our formula for expected value. Expected value is just the number of trials times the probability of success on each trial. So now, and you can also see one thing we're gonna get to, if um, these are a lot of flips, and these distributions look approximately normal. So which graph, uh, determine which graph below goes with each of the following values. So point two is actually for the left graph, all right? And if you look at it, and this is only a few trials, all right, 10 of them, and it's skewed to the right. If the middle one is 0.5, and that's roughly symmetric, and the right one is a 0.9, and that is skewed left. So you'll notice before I had 0.2 and 0.9 and those were not skewed. Those were roughly symmetric, approximately normal. How do we know when it goes from skewed to not skewed? Well, low and high values of P can be symmetric if the sample size N is large enough. So if NP is less than or equal to 10, then it's not normal and it's skewed to the right. If N times Q, where Q is one minus P, is less than or equal to 10, then it's not normal and it's skewed to the left. So for these distributions, we would not use a normal approximation. But if we do meet the condition, if we're greater than 10, then we can use a normal model. All right, so there's, but if we use the normal model, we need a way to calculate standard deviation. And for binomial distributions, this is it. N times P, square root of N times P times Q, or remember Q is one minus P. And in fact, on your math chart, I've used Q a lot of times, some books use Q. When we say Q, we mean one minus P. So here I ask you to determine N, P, and Q. N is 50, P is one fourth or 0.25, and then one minus P is 0.75. Is the distribution left skewed, right skewed, or symmetric? Well, we'll calculate n times p. We get 12.5, so that's higher. We calculate n times 1 minus p, and we get 37.5, so we met the condition for it to be symmetric. So what score would we expect on the test? We just do n times p, 50 times 1 fourth, and get 12.5. And what's the standard deviation we plug in? and we get 3.06 roughly. Let's look at another example where a student rolls a four-sided die 100 times and counts the number of times they roll a one. What is the expected value in standard deviation for the number of times you get a one? So we need n, we need p, and we need one minus p. So expected value is just n times p, in this case 25. Our standard deviation is square root of n times p times one minus p, or in this case about 4.33. And if we draw a rough distribution, you can see it's centered about 25. And um, yeah, it's about, if you go six standard deviations, about 24, 25 wide, all right? So we know anything over here would probably be pretty darn unusual. And that brings us up to our next topic. How do we decide if something is unusual? Well, it was kind of just the rule of thumb and it was decided by the Godfather of Statistics. And he said, you know, if it's less than 5% probability of getting something, we say it's unusual or unexpected. All right, don't know why he didn't pick 4%. He settled for 5%. So that tends to be our rule. So would it be unusual to roll a one on the dice 40 times out of 100? So we're gonna actually look at 40 or more. And you can see that the if I do the probability, 
I'm just going to do it quickly with technology. Normal CDF, the lower is 40, the upper is infinity. The mean is 25, and the standard deviation is 4.33. So I get 0 0.0003, which is 0.03%. Yes, that's unusual. That's very low probability. So you suspect the die is loaded and favors a 1. How many 1s would you have to roll out of 100 to say it is unusual? So if it favors a 1, that's on the high end, right? So I get the z-score for 95% is below, 5% is above. And then I substitute in and solve for the value. So I get that x is 32.12. So anything higher than 32 would imply that maybe the die is loaded. All right. By the way, we'll go ahead and calculate for lower than 32 uh, for a lower value as well. So here we go. I did inverse norm of 0.05 is negative 1.645. And if you substitute in, you see that a low value, anything like 17 and lower, would be considered really unusual as well. So results greater than 32 or less than 18 would be considered unusual. Now we're going to take a look at the geometric model. So first we're just going to look at this uh, bag of M&Ms that has 30% are covered in speckles. What is the probability the first speckled candy is the fourth one you get? Well, I'm going to have to do not speckled, not speckled, not speckled, then speckled. So it's pretty much just multiplying everything out. How about that the first one is the tenth candy I get? So I would multiply that out as well. This brings us to the geometric model, which is the probability of getting the first success on the x attempt. And that is basically 1 minus p to the x minus 1, because you're going to have uh, almost all the first ones up till the very last one, but not including the last one, are failures. So that's the 1 minus p. And then you finally have success on the last attempt. So p is the probability of success on one attempt. And failure is the probability of failure on one, uh, uh, one minus p on uh, one attempt. So when can we use this? Uh, basically, when there are only two outcomes, so kind of like a binomial model. So we have success and failure. It needs to be independent. And we also check the 10% condition. Uh, the prob probability does not change from one trial to the next. One condition we don't have to meet, though, is a fixed number of trials, because this is a different kind of set where we're just going until success. So that one, it's, we can have different numbers of trials. So uh, that's the binomial. I mean, uh, like we do for the binomial model, we don't have that condition. All right. So in Pokemon Go, you throw a Pokeball to Pokemon to try to capture it. Uh, Mrs. Everman estimates that her probability of catching a Pikachu on a single throw of a regular Pokeball is 20%. Is this a Bernoulli trial? Uh, there are only two outcomes on each throw, and either you catch the Pikachu or you don't. We know our P. It doesn't change. It's the same. Our 1 minus P is 0.8, and the result of each throw is independent. So we're good. So what's the probability I'll need three Pokeballs to catch the Pikachu? So what does that mean? It's that my first catch is on the third ball. So I've got my P, 1 minus P, and X is 3. Substitute into the formula. All right and then calculate it, and then that's it. Um, so let's. Go, what does that kind of distribution look like? Well, I found a nice uh, calculator distribution on the internet, and this is actually the distribution for 0 0.20. The only reason I don't like it is it has a zero here instead of a one. So that should really be one, two, three, et cetera. So um, the one thing we can do, these distributions will always be skewed to the right. Why is that? Well, because the numbers are just going to keep getting tinier and tinier. And in theory, it could take an infinite number, but we don't have time for that. So um, it's always going to be skewed to the right. And the reason every number is smaller than the previous one is we're multiplying numbers less than one. And when that happens where you keep doing it, that keeps making it smaller. So that's why it's always going to look similar, like, a, like an e to the minus x distribution. All right. So our mean is just 1 over p, and our standard deviation is the square root of 1 minus p over p. So for this distribution, my mean is 5. So I would expect, on average, to need about 5 Pokeballs to catch a Pikachu. My standard deviation, uh, 1 minus 0.2 over 0.2, and I get 4.47. So I would expect that to vary uh, the number of Pokeballs I need from 5 to vary by about 4.47 typically. All right, 
So my center, if I'm describing the distribution, remember we use cusp, um, is 1 over p. It's five pokeballs. That's the mean. My unusual features don't really have anything unusual here, but it's definitely unimodal and skewed to the right. Let me go back. <laughs> and then the spread, we use a standard deviation for that. It's 4.47 pokeballs. By the way, there's also a nice applet here to calculate a geometric probability. So if you go there, you can just plug in the values, your, your p and uh, your x, and it can calculate it for you. So uh, let's look at the grocery store checkout, and we're going to assume 25% of the customers in store use an express checkout. Let x equal the number of customers it takes for one to use the express checkout until the first one uses it. So what is the probability that one of the first five people will be the first to use the express checkout? Well, first of all, I'm going to check my 10% condition. My trials aren't independent because the population is finite, but definitely the shoppers represent uh, less than 10% of total possible shoppers for a day, or it's a very slow store, all right? So my probability is 0.25. Q equals 1 minus P is 0.75, and these are my values of X. So I'm going to go ahead and substitute in. And so I'm working out the probability that the first person is the first one to check out, and that's a 25% probability. Then that they're the second person, then the third, then the fourth, and then the fifth. Add them all up, and I get about 76%. All right. The other way you could have done this is just taking the complement say none of the first five do it, and that means it would be later. And the probability that none of the first five do it is 0.75 to the fifth, subtract it from one, and you get the same answer. All right, so let's go ahead and calculate and interpret the mean of x. So I need a p, and my expected value is 1 over 0.25, which is 4. So on average, we expect the fourth customer to be the first to use the express checkout. All right, uh, now let's go ahead and calculate the standard deviation. So I have this formula here, 1 minus 0.25. Oh, take the square root, divided by 0.25 is 3.464. So we expect the position for the first customer to check out to typically vary by 3.464 customers from the mean of four customers. 